What's up guys, it is your friendly neighbourhood twat and a Sonic Hat Calamity and while looking at my channel you may see that I'm a fan of Sonic the Hedgehog but I'm also quite the fan of film and I don't think this really gets enough chance to show on the channel so I'm very excited to be joined by Dominic Danson of 12 Noon Films today. Dom, how are you? Hey Jack, I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. I'm very well. And yeah, today we're going to talk to you about your latest project that you are currently crowdfunding that I'm very, very excited for um, after watching the trailer. I Am Nowhere. Yeah, well, I'm glad someone's excited for it. I'm oh, dude, one. Th this looks like a, a sci-fi kind of epic that I could be into. Yeah, I think it should be, it should be, I was about to say it should be a laugh. It's not going to be a laugh at all. <laughs> it's going to be bleak and depressing and exactly the opposite of what we need right now. But, you know, uh, it's something that should be interesting for us to make anyway. Yeah, I understand that. I mean, bleak and depressing, but kind of relatable in these in these times as well. Letting you know other people know, knowing other people feel the same way you do. That's always a comfort, I yeah. guess. Yeah, there's a sense of um, I think, particularly at the moment, people having a sense of loneliness and and all of that kind of feeling of, of isolation, um, particularly with mini restrictions coming back. <laughs> oh um, God. <laughs> It's going to make everything a little bit curious in the run-up to Christmas, isn't it? Yeah, just a bit. I mean, will we will we have full families around the table for Christmas dinner? Who I knows? Don't know, I don't know. Find well, out next week yeah. on Life. No. This is why I make things. I <laughs> exactly, exactly. That's the way to do it, man. That's the way to do it. So, well, I thought I should probably ask you a few questions about this because, as I said, I'm really excited and I would love for the guys who watch the channel to get a bit of info about it and and learn a bit more and um, you obviously we've shouted you out in the stream a few times now but this is really the kind of way for them to get into the nitty-gritty of it all yeah, um, thank you for that so right no, thank you for being here i really appreciate it um let's get started so, so my first question was that i am nowhere revolves around this idea of getting off the grid um what inspired this so the film is written by a good friend of mine uh, called Samuel Adams. He is a, a Hertfordshire-based uh, writer. And he sort of went back to the, the core concept of you know, those, those old war films, uh, people surviving a, a turmoil or some kind of fracas somewhere. Uh, and he kind of said, well, if that was going to happen now, it would probably be digital. And if something digital happened on the scale of the atomic bomb what would the damage be what how would it change the world and he came up with this scenario that if all technology became fatal to use what would happen to people everybody using technology at the time that this digital bomb went off would immediately die yay uh, Scrooge having fun, reduce the circuit's population, uh, but everybody else would need to survive in a way that is almost entirely technologically free. So it's a, a sense of back to basics. Um, what happens to a, a human being or a group of human beings when technology is stripped away from them, when all the, the comforts they used to are stripped away from them? And at what point do you sacrifice your own humanity for simple survival see that that's such a, a fascinating concept to me um i think that's genuinely more terrifying than the idea of zombies or the idea of an evil superman the, you know yes. it's how would i personally revert to a way of, of no technology at all yeah and it's just has got nothing on this it's ex exactly um, yeah well, i mean it's, it's that sense that everything that you have, everything that you're used to gets taken away. I mean, this, what we're doing right now, would yeah. immediately kill us. It's great fun. Wow. Um, yeah, what what happens when when you can't have any of that? What happens when all of your creature comforts are taken away and, and can you survive? And can you still be a human at the same time? That's, uh, yeah, I really like that as a concept. I really, really like that as a concept. It's just, no, because it's, I, I love these premises that really make you question. Um, whereas I have my sides of, you know, franchises, whatever that I like, they kind of just dump it to you on a plate and that's what it is. I love those 
those stories where you come away from it and you're constantly questioning after you're constantly thinking about things um i think probably my most recent um entry into doing that kind of thing would be joker a film oh, like yeah. that right i came away from it and i was like wow asking myself continuous questions and yeah I, I really like the idea of that dude i'm really really interested in in seeing how that turns out it kind of reminds me as well i don't know if you've um heard of it but dc comics recently did a series called deceased no i've not um it's where dark side gets the anti-life equation and he puts it into cyborg and cyborg oh, gets smart. oh dude he gets cyborg gets back to earth and just uploads it to the internet and anyone looks at a screen as a zombie and it's just crazy crazy stuff to go and watch that that sounds like it might have some kind of parallels that I'm, i may want to go and look at you know what i'm i'm in the office tomorrow i will leave the comic on your desk i'm not gonna be in the office for a good long time <laughs> all right okay well if not we'll fi- we'll figure something out i might post it to you or something well okay l- let me continue with my questioning um so many of us have played with this idea of completely isolating ourselves i've done it a few times i think social media in a way is kind of evil and uh sometimes i'm like no i'm i'm away from it all i'm going off the grid never really seems to work out we have lives and jobs and responsibilities and whatnot but what kind of drew you to this concept sort of exactly that um we are infinitely connected at the moment and it's it's both absolutely wonderful in one sense and completely tragic in another. So gone are the days where you know everybody on your street, your immediate community are the ones that pick you up and support you. And you know Jill two doors down and Michael the other way. Uh, names of my actual neighbours, I'm quite happy. <laughs> Shout um, out to them. Yeah. <laughs> It can, technology and communications technology particularly, can do the exact opposite. By being so connected and seeing so many things going on all at the same time, you kind of lose a little bit of your soul, I think. Um, I I trained originally to be a journalist, and one of the the fascinating statistics for me that came out when uh, Facebook first really, really started was that we were then, at, at that point, consuming something like a new york times worth of words in a day like every single person was consuming that amount of information in a day and now we're at some a a point where we're scrolling through like 60 kilometers worth of posts and texts every year and you can't get away and and you've you've done the same thing that that i have i have also had detoxes from social media and technology i've had periods where I, I'll turn off my computer or I won't have a, a phone on, I'll delete apps. But there's always something. There's always a TV in the corner. There's always the thought that you could turn your phone back on. Uh, and it, it becomes kind of an addiction. Yeah. So when Samuel came to me um, I, and my wife, who runs the production company with me, with this script, uh, we looked at it and immediately went, that is like a detox on acid. What happens if essentially you you treat that technology like a drug can people put that down and then reconnect with each other um and and that really drew me into it and we started uh, obviously you've, you've seen the the concept trailer there and we, we started building the world around that idea and and trying to flesh out this sort of place that people would be in where just like mentally let alone physically where you had to cope without technology without that drug um and and where that balance is i think it's it's a really it's an interesting and terrifying idea i mean you might find it quite liberating but at at some point it's going to be like oh i can't just place a phone call to people if i if i miss them i am genuinely alone yeah i that's i think that's something that when we think of these social media detoxes and that kind of thing, it's not something we really take into consideration, um, just how disconnected we are. And I was actually saying this to somebody recently that gone, I think it was a lot easier to socially interact when I was younger and obviously when you were as well, in the sense that when you went to school from nine till three o'clock in the afternoon, that was your social interaction. That was your time. And when you went home, you 
grew with you know your parents you had your family life and that kind of thing but now there's absolutely no escape from that people can reach me 24 hours a day pretty much with no restrictions in the way and i think it's i think i the comparison of it being like a drug i think is very valid i, I was once watching a ted talk where someone said when you get that message that flood of dopamine you get is is so addictive and i, I think it, in a it, way it very much is a drug and i think yeah. a lot of people do struggle with it i mean there's a reason that i've come back to social media every time after saying i'm done with it and that's that's not really because i'm like yes social media is fixed and is all good no it's because it's addictive in nature it's i think it's a combination you're absolutely right it's addictive in nature but it's also so woven into the fabric of contemporary society that we can't do without it yeah and like the the school comparison is interesting when i was at school you're right you would have nine till three o'clock you have a bit of social life and then you go home and either you like you do your homework you maybe get to watch transformers um <laughs> and and then maybe go out and play with kids on your street yeah um or like if if uh, there was a, a couple of the kids that I was at school with when I was at junior school lived around the corner from me. So we'd go down to the local play area or go bike riding or whatever. And what we have now is completely the opposite, I think, of that. Everybody's communicating through a device. You look at something else and do your communicating through that. Everything changes because there's a filter on it. There's different words you can choose, you can edit, you can change rather than our just going out and being and yeah. it's, it's, that's actually quite interesting because if you thought of the world 20 years before we were kids you wouldn't even go home and watch cartoons you wouldn't watch tv yeah so that's the kind of world that we're getting back to this isn't it's not that we're going back to pre-industrial revolution in the film but we're going back to people knowing everything they know now you just you can't go home and turn on the TV. You can't phone your loved ones. You can't communicate with anybody else. And it just so happens to be that most of the people are dead. God, yeah. That's awesome. That, that's really... I, I love delving into these kind of concepts. And yeah, and obviously having the sci-fi take on it as well is something oh, yeah. that's it's a big one. I know it's a big one for you too. You know, I've I've seen the Office posters. Back yeah, to the I'm Future, Dune. Sci-fi nerd. Yeah, just a bit. I've always wanted to ask you, actually. This isn't really part of the interview, but we will include it in the video. Is that the Death Star throne room as your background on your PC? Okay, good, good, good. Of course it is. Good. good. Well, at least I didn't embarrass myself by thinking it was when it was something else. So, well done me for getting that. Correct. I mean, I think it is. It's been six months since I've seen my desktop PC at the office, but, um, yeah, I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay, you know. Well, as long as you haven't changed it, then I was on point. <laughs> what are you doing on my computer? Well, I, I am a computer engineer. I do, I do have to do I things did. with the computers, you know, but I digress. Um, so how did you decide that you wanted to be a filmmaker? What, what brought you to this? Accident. Fair uh, enough. How far back do you want to go? No, tell us. Tell all. Years. I was born in a small town in <laughs> Um, I, so I, not, not going back to university or anything, but, uh, I used to live in Bath, uh, and, uh, went through a bad breakup and a friend of mine suggested that I went and did a, a local drama workshop that led me to go into drama school. So I trained as an actor for two years in London. After I graduated drama school, I was in a bunch of short films, uh, stage plays, TV commercials and things. And it was great. Uh, something that, that struck me was that there weren't that many good showreel filmmakers out there. Um, people who would just shoot a, a scene for an actor. And this, this was like 10 years ago. Um, and I was living with uh, a friend of mine at the time who's a filmmaker, like trained university educated filmmaker. Uh, so we made a showreel for somebody uh, and it was all right. And then another friend of mine, Lee Stapleton, who's a, a director of photography, annoyingly moved to New Zealand, <laughs> um, which is probably safer right now. Um, yeah. He then stepped in and helped make a few more showreels and taught me the basics of using uh, a camera. We were shooting on like a Canon 5D Mark II. It was brilliant. 
um from there i was like this is this is kind of interesting i've always wanted to know how cameras work and now i'm learning a little bit more and two of the first people that i shot showreels for um friends of mine glenn and amy they then came to uh, joe my wife and i and said look we're going to enter a comic con 60 hour film race do you want to help so I don't know if you know about these things, but they're, yeah. We, yeah, we've done ones in, in the past, like the, the Sci-Fi London 48 hour one, where awesome. you've got like two days or three days, you have a topic, you write an entire script and shoot an entire film and deliver it in a couple of days. We did that. Uh, we made a film called The Silent Name um, and we got top 10. Oh, wow. Uh, in of like 180 or something submissions. And I was like, this is, this is quite good. Um, so it was, a, it was a combination of that and the slightly arrogant, egotistical thing of whenever I went to see a play, I always thought something was missing. I was like, maybe I could help make that better um, and, and sort of found that whenever I was rehearsing a play that I was in, I would help giving other people notes. And I kind of thought, you know what, I'm probably not an actor. I think I might be a director. So I started exploring that. And for the last few years, I've been directing more than, than I, I haven't actually been acting. So uh, I think I think I found the, the niche that I might fit there. At least I hope. Uh, yeah. But yeah, that's that's kind of it in a nutshell. So it was it was going from drama school into an accidental uh, diversion into <laughs> short films. And now we're here. Fair enough, man. That's, that's I, I always love those kind of stories where people fall into things it's it's not um planned a kind of predetermined yeah. thing probably why i like spider-man so much you know the idea that it's not a planned yeah. destiny thing it's and then that's, yeah, yeah and then so i love that you, you you own it you yeah rock up and and you do your best and i think unless so, you're gonna unless you know that you want to be something like a doctor or a lawyer yeah you can do that you you have the facility particularly now with the readily accessible communications and, and information we have thank you internet <laughs> to learn all that other stuff you yeah. can go and, and watch channels like film right and indie mogul that i i have taught myself a lot of uh, filmmaking by watching these things and, and it's it's incredible you can change your career if you want to yeah 100 percent. It, it's all in in people's hands at the end of the day and once you've uh, got your hands on the right tools to get there it's all about your passion and all about your drive and, and how you can push it. And I think more people in the world kind of need to uh, believe that in themselves. You've got the, you've got the thing to do it. And I think you're, yeah. you're living proof of that right now. Do you know what I mean? Like, well, it's, it's, like, it's if awesome. If you've got something that you care about, go and do it. A hundred percent. There shouldn't be anything that steps in the way. I mean, practically speaking, sometimes there are, but yeah. when it comes to something like filmmaking, if you want to do it, go and do it. Yeah. hundred percent. I completely agree with you. Um, I mean, what, what, Directors, would you say you uh, you draw the most influence from in this regard? Uh, it depends on the mood of the day. Um, uh, classic ones, obviously Spielberg, Kubrick, Scorsese. Everybody loves most of their films. They're yep. great. Um, at the moment, uh, like particularly visually, uh, a lot of Denis Villeneuve's stuff I, I really like. So Arrival. Uh, Blade Runner 2049, the Dune trailer that drops like what was it yesterday or today? Yeah, dude, um, looks stunning. Yeah. Um, so I think stuff like that, and and there's a certain amount of um, like Sam Mendes's work that that I'm really enjoying, um, and and I'm I'm drawn a lot to uh, directors of photography at the moment as well. And okay. Like, I mean, like everybody's talking about Roger Deakins, but hmm. when you look back at his his older work, like 1984, and extrapolate right up until now, you've got this body of interesting visual storytelling as well. So, I think you've got some people in there who are like actors, directors, and you've got some people who are very visual directors, and I, I think that that kind of balance um, for me is is crucial. Yeah, I'd agree with that, and you, you definitely brought up some some great examples there like blade runner 2099 i think is such an underrated film uh, uh beautifully yeah. shot um really doesn't get enough a credit lot of patience to watch it yeah. you really have to sit down and, and commit yourself to it 100 percent. but I, I definitely think you're right in that got some some fantastic examples um yeah i mean how how 
difficult is it to mould so many styles together, do you find? Is it... How do I put this? Just because tonally bringing in so many different styles and, and trying to incorporate these different works, how do you, in your own kind of personal bubble, find that way of bringing that together? I think it's a really good question. Um, and, and I think the, the important thing to, to note is that it's never about taking somebody else's style and applying it to something you're doing. Yeah. It's taking inspiration from somebody else, something else. Uh, a lot of filmmakers will go and look at classical works of art, you know, like Rembrandt and, and the, the classical portrait painters, and they will take inspiration. So for me, I think it's about knowing what your project is, knowing what your story is at its very core, and then figuring out what elements that inspire you build up the patchwork of that uh, that piece. So yeah. uh, like you, you could look at some incredible, incredible work from, um, I don't know, Kubrick, say, and look at the film that we're about to make, and you go, actually, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily match. So for me, I think yeah. it's, it's, it's really important to take note of all of those things that are good in other people's work and figure out what makes them good and why, learn from that, and then find your own way of layering in the authenticity of it. Like you, um, John Cleese talks once upon a time, many, many moons ago, uh, about the actor's paint box. It's like, as a, an actor, you, you really want a, a, an emotional paint box. You're like, oh, a little bit of that one, a little bit yeah. of that one, a little bit of this, and it makes up your character. I think that's exactly the same for uh, any really creative work, writing, filmmaking, directing, whatever it might be. So I think you, you take facets of things that are in your toolkit that you've learned and observed, and you apply them through your own taste and your own choices to the project that, that you're working on. And hopefully they all come together um, and, and fit. But the other side of things that is, is stupendously important for stuff like this is that you're not doing it alone. It's uh, a film is never one person's work unless it is literally just one person with a camera filming landscapes. Um, <laughs> there's always something else in it. There's always a character in it. There's always another collaborator. So uh, Samuel, who, who wrote the piece, obviously we're working closely together. Uh, his husband's going to be in it. My wife is uh, producing it and she's going to be in it. Uh, we've got a, a very, very talented um, DOP, John Sellings, uh, who works on a lot of feature film visual effects work. Uh, he's a, a digital compositor. So he's going to be DOPing the piece. Um, we've got uh, a, a really wonderful illustrator, Scott Gazard, who is going to be doing storyboards and artboards for us very kindly. Um, and, and he did them for the, the little concept trailer that we did as well, which were, they, I mean, they were invaluable. But you've got all these people, so you can word vomit to them and say, this is the picture in my brain. Help me bring the picture in my brain into a lens somewhere. I agree. As long as you understand all of that stuff and you're not doing it alone, then that'll be fine. Yeah. It sounds like you've got an, uh, an amazing collaboration of people working on this. Um, yeah. It's just... It, and, and the thing is, knowing you personally and, and how passionate you are about things, like I'm really excited to see what you guys bring together for this because I think this is really going to gonna pop off in that regard. I'm um, looking forward to seeing it. Well, you might have to... You might have to let me have a quick sneak preview of it before it goes up, put a review on the channel, something of that nature. We can do that. Awesome, do awesome. That. Um, so where do you find yourself most at home? Behind a camera or in an editing suite? A little bit both. You knew okay. I was going to say that. I did, I did. Um, it it, it kind of does depend because both of them are connected, um, but both of them happen separately. So... If, if I'm directing a piece, it's really nice to not be the person who is hands-on with the camera. You can give your focus to uh, the DOP, to the actors, to the environment, to the story, and you can not drop your focus. Um, if I'm operating a camera at, at the same time as I'm, I'm directing, there's got to be a fine balance. But I really enjoy finding the right angles, finding some interesting lighting, finding the best visual way to tell that story. But Editing is always going to have a little special place for me because it it reminds me of my earlier days as a as a journalist. 
because you take sections of this story that you have made, things that you film little uh, sequences and, and set pieces, and you start stitching them together. And sometimes you might find something in an edit that you didn't see on the day. And there are so many um, videos and articles out there about films that were saved in the edit, including yeah. Star Wars. Yeah. It was made in the edit. So I think the two are fundamentally and intrinsically connected. To be a good director and a good DOP on set, I think you have to understand a bit about how the editing process works. And to be yeah, a good course. editor, you've got to understand how the storytelling side of things works along with all the technical side and yeah. to be a good director you have to be able to marry the two of those so i, I, can, I really yeah. enjoy both yeah i i completely understand where you're coming from i mean i obviously i'm not on the level of you know creating a a short film however i Dude, i you run a youtube channel I, with what that's over it. A thousand subscribers? it is over a thousand subscribers it's kind of mad yeah but you know it's the same thing you know i'm just trying to stitch together a narrative a lot of the time but then there's a lot of things i've learned on both sides things that i can do when i'm filming that will make things easier from an editing standpoint and vice versa you know yeah. so i i completely get where you're coming from with that and it's funny i i wanted to ask that question because it's actually a question i've been asked as well and i wanted to get some other opinions on it because i'm very much the same i can't really pick a favorite so yeah. it's it's quite interesting to hear that you've got the same opinion on that yeah when you're the content creator or the director or whoever you all of the stuff is kind of your baby yeah that you're connected to all of it you want to see all of it you want it all to thrive and do really really well but 100%, i mean yeah. do you ever look back at stuff that you did like last year because i know i do this all the time and you think I could do that better now. Yeah. I look at... So my biggest video has 19,000 views. It was the leaked Sonic games to 2019. And now I just wish I could go back in time, re-edit that video. I could, yeah. I could be on 19,000 subscribers if I re-edited that video and did it properly, you know? And I, I yeah, I think that's that's part of growing, isn't it? As as a content creator, as, as a director, a producer, anything, it's... You're always going to look back at your stuff and slightly cringe and be like, you know what, yeah. that could have been done better. But that all that shows is you're growing. I think yeah. if you could consistently look at your old content and be like, that's top of the line, that's the best I've ever done. You're not yeah. growing I in any way. Completely agree. If you look at something that you did last year and you think you nailed it, you've done something wrong, or yeah. you haven't learned anything in the last twelve months. So what have you been doing? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. No, that's exactly it. Well, I think I'll leave you with one last question um, before we go into the plugathon. Um, you know, what can we expect from the future? Um, the real future or the future of the film, because they are two um, very similar places. In do, do you know what you can? You can give us a rundown of both if you fancy. Let's, let's not. Um, <laughs> we'll be here for a while. Um, I, I think for for the immediate future we're going to be focused on on I am for a little while it's the yeah. biggest project that we have have taken on to date so it's, it's going to consume a lot of our time yeah um this year was going to hold another 48 hour film challenge for us uh but obviously with covid that has gone out the window so if that comes back next year i would like to be doing that but we also have a number of of other scripts uh, and other stories in in the works we've got another writer that we work with uh helen jennings uh, who is Bromley based and has written the last two 48 hour film uh, scripts that we've done. She's got a couple of really cool short stories that we want to turn into films. So I think uh, the plan will be to get I Am Nowhere done, um, hopefully submit it to some festivals. And if it's not utterly dreadful, maybe see if we can get a rosette or two and then move on to the next project. Um, we, we always want to be creating i mean you know as a content creator you don't really want to yeah. stop doing the thing that you're passionate about so i think as soon as we've got this one in the can we're gonna make another one awesome can't, can't wait to see what happens and i can't wait to see i am nowhere so guys you know what to do hatchlings click the link in the description go and donate let's get this project up and running let's get some steam behind it because well, get some steam behind it. I looked at your your numbers for the other day. You're already doing quite well. You're already well on the way. Um, yeah, we're doing all right. We've got twenty backers at the moment. I think we've raised a, a little over seven hundred quid. We sort of we figure that we can do it 
and make it good for about two, two and a half grand. Um, yeah. But we've, we've set our target at five just to try and be a little bit stretchy. Yeah. Um, but we're obviously putting our own money into it as well. We've, we've invested in gear. We're doing locations. We're trying to pull in favors and we've put our own cash into it. So it's not like we're just saying to people, ah, oh, we want to make a film. Give us the money for it. Yeah. We're actually completely. doing something. Um, yeah. We're putting our money where our mouth is. 100%. Yeah. yeah. I think, well, from me knowing you that, I never doubted that was going to be the case. And, <laughs> you know, with with the way things are in the world at the moment, uh, we need to really be supporting art, the arts in any way that we can, really. I know people are out there saying that it's not the most important thing in the world, but it's kept you all occupied during lockdown. Yeah. It's what's going to continue to keep you occupied in the future. And it is one of the, the areas that really doesn't seem to have support at the moment during all of this that's going on. It's so, crazy. It's like yeah. the arts are, are fundamental to, to human existence. I mean, 100%. before anything that we've got, we tell stories. It's yep. for my money, it's the one thing that sets us aside from any other living, breathing creature. We tell stories to each of us and to other people. And to not fund the people who tell those stories at, at a high level, I think is is madness because you lose storytelling you lose the essence of what human beings are and then there's yeah. no point a hundred percent i mean we're kind of experiencing on my other other job yes my other other job just checking which one um the other job in the in terms of the club scene and djing mm. you know we're it's another section of the arts has just been completely left behind yeah. there's no uh clear direction in sight no. Um, uh, and it's it's difficult and we've got to try and support people as best we can and the best way for all the hatchlings watching this right now to do that is to click that link in the description if you can donate what, what you can it really helps you know push this forward helps 12 new films and Mr. Danson which is exactly what we want out of things so you know Dom what, any anything you want to share promote plug now it's a chance, bang, 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 even though we've kind of plugged it, plug it more. I love the, that you call your subscribers hatchlings. That's it's brilliant. great. That was It was a fan-chosen name as well. Really? I didn't even pick it. I love so. it because it's so multi-layered. You've got <laughs> your surname, and you've got the fact that whenever you jump on a little plunger at the end of a Sonic game, that everything seems to hatch out of it. It's all yep. Um, all yeah, works very good um <laughs> I, th I think you've said it all i don't think i need to say uh anything else like anything that anybody can donate is is stupendously appreciated anyone who has uh, a talent and they might want to get involved in the project then drop us a line i mean we're we haven't decided on on composers or anything yet uh, visual effects artists we've got a crew up so if anyone wants to get involved in making a film then drops a line but yeah that that funding is is so key as i said we've we put some of our own money into it and and now it's just building everything out so that we can we can do the right thing like we want to be able to pay our actors when we get them um anyone who's not already in the 12 noon crew like we're going to have to cast a couple of actors we won't be able to pay those anyone who who can give us a little bit of, of oomph to level up the project we want to be able to pay them we won't be able to pay for a, a good location so that we're not shooting this in a tent in somebody's back garden which would be rubbish yeah i mean we, we're going to go and make this film anyway but if we can get that little bit of budget it will really level it up uh, and most of that is, is probably going to be the location but yeah anything that anyone can spare 50p you can go and there's a little custom value box um yeah it's i hate asking for money i feel like bob geldof on a really bad day but <laughs> yeah and if no, it's I understand that. ours go and back a film Go and back uh, a theatre project. Go and back something. Go trawl GoFundMe, Indiegogo, Kickstarter, you know, find local theatres or whatever. Because the arts are suffering and they shouldn't yeah. be. I feel for every single one of my friends who is still an actor in theatre, they're screwed. Yeah. So if you care about storytelling in any way, even if it's not our one, even if you don't like our one, go and back something just a little bit. Yeah, I completely agree with that sentiment and hopefully most people watching this are going to feel the same way about that because we really do need to get the arts up, up and running again, start supporting people and to be honest, guys, go check out the trailer for I Am Nowhere because I genuinely think you're going to be very excited for this if you love your sci-fi elements, 
then there's a lot of sci-fi elements in this little teaser and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Well, thank you, Dom, so, so much for joining me this evening. I really, really appreciate it. Um, thank you. And I just I can't wait. Um, make sure you back it, guys. Link in description. But until then, until next time, uh, keep it locked here to Calamity because that's what it tastes to be a Calamity, all that jazz, and I'll see you guys very, very soon. Lots of love. Bye.